Uh, just a little bit about us. We are Global Initiative for Expert Manual Therapists. We started this because we found that there is a huge gap between people who have basic education and people who are fellowship trained in the US and people who are in the who are fellowship trained, which is myself and Dr. Steve. We are exposed to a lot of recent research, exposed to a lot of skills which are not taught in the basic education. So the idea, idea behind this was to start a program which mimics a fellowship program in the US. And we have a program running in currently in India. We just started our cohort two back in December. And the, co the program is one year. We come to India twice a, uh, twice a year for two hands-on session, hands sessions. And, and we meet one weekend a month which is eight hours to discuss a certain topic, a certain module, and talk what is the recent research about it, what is the trend about it. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I think we're planning to come again in March and April timeframe. And uh, the two cities we have selected this time around is Delhi and Bombay. And uh, we plan to come to Southern India at some point. Uh, without talking too much, I think I'm gonna give time to Prashant to talk about. Prashant is a seasoned therapist. He's, he owns his own practice in Aurangabad. He's been practicing for almost a decade. Yeah. He's gone through our, our certificate in evidence-based practice or evidence-based orthopedic manual therapy program. He's certified in dry needling. He's a seasoned guy, has done his, his certification in rehab trainer, has been doing this for a long time. And, thing is it doesn't matter how long you've been practicing you have these research trends you see and which makes you think that uh, am i practicing right or uh, can i need to modify something so and i think that's it from my side i think over to you prashant i mean yeah i think teach us something i think this is an important interesting topic yeah yeah thank you very much sir good morning everyone good evening if suppose somebody is from the outside india now, uh, our topic is most common first diagnosis of piriformis syndrome. So, there are many, my students are also there in the PPT and uh, in this lecture. So, we are practicing since, uh, few are practicing since many years, few are just interns and all. So, we are seeing most of the cases we are seeing piriformis syndrome. So, most commonly, we, as we are saying, it is a piriformis syndrome. But most most of the times it is a false diagnosis. So in the this PPT we are going to see the contents would be like uh, hip and pelvis anatomy. After that we are going to see the biomechanics and arthrokinematics. After that we are going to cover common causes of posterior hip pain. Uh, what are the special tests for that? And most important part which we have covered the research and literature. On the basis of that we have made this PPT. And later on we are going to discuss an interesting case study which will help us to know uh, how the diagnosis should be done or what we are missing as a physio and what physician or orthopedicians are also missing. So this is a very interesting uh, case study. And later on, the uh, important part, treatment and exercises should be there. Yeah. Now we'll start with the hip, hip anatomy. So hip joint is composed of uh, acetabulum and the femur, the head of the femur. So if you see the acetabulum is a part of the pelvic bone, which is made up of the ilium, ischium and pubis bones. So which is going to the attach to your, uh, going to attach your pelvis bone. So it is the diathodial joint, which is the synovial joint, which has a three, uh, three degree of freedom. So this is the composed of uh, main acetabulum and the femur bone. Next, Durumi. So if you see the image, the femur bone is, the head of the femur is attached to the acetabulum socket cavity. And later on, next. Dhrumi. Yeah. So uh, ligaments of the hip joint. So any joint, is supported by the ligaments and the muscles. The ligaments play an important role. 
important role while the stabilizing the joint so anteriorly it has been supported by the iliofemoral and pubofemoral ligament where posteriorly it is supported by the ischiofemoral ligament it will help help to stabilize the joint by uh, just preventing the ex excessive translation translation of the bones and it will help us to make it happen the normal range of motions so these are the images these are the images of the ligaments where iliofemoral ligaments are am i audible to you all yeah you you good you good prashant yeah these are these are the ligaments around the hip and yeah. pelvis yeah these are the ligaments uh, around the hip and pelvis so anteriorly we are seeing the iliofemoral ligament is there and the pubofemoral ligament there and posteriorly it is supported by the ischiofemoral ligament next room next now we are going to see the muscles of the hip joint so muscle of the anterior compartment as we are seeing uh, in the images the tensor fasciae lata calcareus and the quadriceps femoris which consists of the four uh, four muscles so this is this is the elementary education or this we have seen in uh, in our first year of the college but just to revise everything i am just letting you know so quadriceps femoris is uh, just made up of four muscles which uh, includes rectus femoris vastus lateralis vastus medialis and vastus intermedius and articular genu now we'll see the medial compartment so in medial compartment we have the adductor where we can see the adductor longus magnus brevis and ischial head of adductor magnus and uh, gracilis muscle which will help help us to uh, adduction of the hip joint now we'll go to the posterior compartment of the hip which will uh, maximum uh, which will help us in extension of the hip where gluteus maximus is the major larger group is present around the ilium where the all the hamstrings are covering the posterior part of your uh, posterior part of your thigh which contains of semi tendinosus semi membranosus and biceps femoris next now uh, today's topic is uh, the false diagnosis of piriformis syndrome so uh, we are going to see the posterior part the deeper muscle of the hip joint so if we can see the, there are piriformis gemelli super gemelli inferior gemelli obturator internus obturator externus and quadratus femoris are present at the back of the hip but if we see uh, according to the research there are close proximity between the piriformis tendon obturator internus and gemellus inferior so it when whenever if you see any problems around the piriformis muscle so research study shows that there will be the involvement of obturator internus with with the inferior gemellus so when you have the hip pain if you are saying the piriformis is the uh, uh, piriformis is going to hamper the function so not only the piriformis there are the chances of uh, superior gemelli obturator internus and gemella inferior in the hip joint next okay i think uh, so the point is that we call it piriformis syndrome but we look at the literature we look at ultrasound studies we see the problem is just not in piriformis problem is in these two muscles as well inferior gemelli and obturator internus whenever there is a issue with piriformis so should we call it a piriformis syndrome just think about it so these are the muscles with the movement the flexion is uh, flexion is caused by the soft major iliacus rectus femoris sartorius pectineus where extension is caused by gluteus max and hamstring muscles where abduction is caused by gluteus maximus minimus medius and the tensor fasciae lata where adduction is caused by adductor mangus longus brevis gracilis and uh, internal rotators are medius minimus gluteus medius minimus tfl and the iliacus where external rotators are gluteus maximus piriformis obturator internus superior inferior gemelli and quadratus femoris so now after the anatomy uh, we are going to see the biomechanics so what is the need of the biomechanics as a physio we have been treating the muscles till now because uh, before joining the gym class i was also doing the tens and ultrasound all those things i used to do 
but uh, after uh, completing the course from the jam i came to know biomechanics is also important where we are not we are not focusing on the bones so the bone movements are also necessary for the diagnosis assessment and the treatment purpose so because of that we have added the biomechanics so in biomechanics we are going to see the osteokinematics and arthrokinematics so what is that osteokinematics osteokinematics means like there is the bony levers all the bones are present there what are the uh, what what is the movements are happening in the bony lever in the space when the physiological joint motions are happening where arthrokinematics is uh, what while doing the bony movements what the the surface which is happening between the joint what kind of motions are happening in the joint for example if i am doing the hip flexion so hip flexion is the osteokinematics but what is the arthrokinematics for the hip flexion so while doing the hip flexion there is a spinning and anterior posterior movement are happening at the acetabulum and uh, acetabulum and the head of the femur so the spinning movements which is happening at the anterior posterior direction while doing hip flexion and extension is the arthrokinematics where the action which i was doing flexion that was the osteokinematics drumi uh uh now uh, with the movements with uh, flexion extension will uh, will cover the what is the arthromatics happening as i have explained while doing the flexion and extension there are the spinning movements are occurring at the femoral joint in the acetabulum cavity so the, there will be the anterior and posterior glide with the spinning movement happens uh, when we do the hip flexion and extension while in abduction there will be the inferior glide will be happen at the femur when we do the hip abduction so we can see there is the inferior glides are happening because the head of the femur is moving in uh, inferior direction while we are doing the abduction so while doing the adduction this is the adduction so the head of the femur will go the in superior direction where in internal and external rotation this is the internal rotation this is the external rotation so in external rotation femoral head goes posteriorly femoral go head goes posteriorly while doing the external rotation femoral goes anteriorly so this is the important part we have, we have to see while doing the assessment the what is the hip arthrokinematics are happening while the range of motion next so these are the images where uh, osteokinematics and arthrokinematics are uh, has been shown when the first image is of shoulder uh, sorry hip flexion second is in abduction and adduction third one is the medial rotation of the hip and fourth one is the lateral rotation of the hip next now we are going to see uh, we have we have gone through the hip range of motions hip arthrokinematics and biomechanics now we are going to see the motions are happening at the pelvis on the femur so whenever the hip joint is uh, uh, weight bearing so when we are standing so at the uh, at that time we get the motion at uh, motion at the pelvis so my hip joint is weight bearing now i am standing on my both the legs now i am moving so my hip joint is fixed and at that time the motion is happening at the pelvis see i am doing the flexion so my hip joint is fixed so the action is happening at my pelvis when i am doing extension the action is happening at my pelvis so the biomechanics is there so we can go to the next slide uh, the images wala sai yeah so if you see, if you can see the images there are two horizontal lines has been drawn on the both the asi level and psi level when your pelvis is aligned so it has to be at the same level both the horizontal line has to be at the same level but when you do the flexion see when you do the flexion so while doing the hip flexion there will be the anterior tilting of the pelvis will happen you can imagine the things so because of that i have uh, put the images on 
so while doing the flexion please uh, please review the second image while doing the hip flexion there will be the anterior tilting of the pelvis is happening to so see i am doing the flexion so automatically i am going slightly ahead so anterior pelvic tilting is happening where the sacral base and the sacrum is moving posteriorly it is going the away from the body and while doing extension while doing extension posterior pelvic tilting is happening where sacrum is going into the close close proximity of the hip joint so we need to know the how the joints are moving while assessing the joints or while assessing the any uh, diagnosis next लैटरल पेल्विक टेल या शुड आई कंटिन्यू सर यस यस या now we are going to see the lateral pelvic tilt so as we know the tendinum back sign the if you have the less uh, power at the gluteus medius muscle then you will find the lateral pelvic tilt yeah sorry i was reading the comment yeah so you will find the lateral pelvic tilt but if you see uh when the muscle uh, if is so lateral pelvic tilt is in frontal plane of the axis which happens around the antero posterior axis so what is the function of the gluteus medius it it holds the opposite side of pelvis at the neutral position but if we found uh, the gluteus medius power is less than 3 or 3 so the opposite side pelvis will drop so the reason behind is this if you find any sac sacral sacroiliac dysfunction so there will be the neurological neurophysiological insufficiency happens at gluteus medius or because of that uh, because of that there will be uh, uh, shutting down the uh, the shutting down of gluteal gluteus medius happens and because of that that is unable to hold the pelvis at the position so the holding of the uh, pelvis will be uh, counter react by the tfl so that there will be that uh, hyper hypertonicity or hyperactivity of tfl happens so there is the reason why we have the, all the patients get the tfl tightness that's a very important point so if you have like gluteus medius weakness tfl will substitute for the weak glute med and your obers could be positive next to me now we are going to see the common causes of posterior hip pain next grooming so uh, first cause we are going to see uh, just we are going to see one law hilton's law the law says that the joint is supplied by the branches from the nerve supplying muscles acting on it what does this mean this means if uh, a particular nerve is there which is supplying to that joint and it that is supplying the muscles also around that joint and the ligament around that joint so whenever that nerve gets uh, interrupted the function of that nerve get interrupted so there will be the uh, there will be the uh, problems happen at that same joint so uh, according to that based on that hilton's law so uh, if you get the referred pain your in your hip so it might be the uh, you will get the back pain because uh, the hip muscle is mostly uh, supplied by the l3 nerve roots so if you find any difficulty in l3 nerve root or if you find any damage or uh, any this, uh, derangements at the l3 joint so you can find the same referral pain in, in your hip because the hip uh, muscles are supplied by the l3 nerve so this is the hilton's law you should remember the nerve which is supplying to that joint and muscles can refer pain to your the muscles which is it is supplying next the point which i have covered the hip receives the innervation from the branches of lumbosacral plexus 
from L2 to S1 and predominantly from the L3 in the root. So if you find any uh, problems in L3 in the root, the pain might you might get the pain in, on your posterior hip joint. Uh, sorry to interrupt, uh, Dr. Prashant. Can you repeat Hilton's law one more time? Like I think it is a little complex. Yeah, the uh, I'll tell you in another. Uh, I'm not going to state the same sentence like that. The joint is supplied by the branch branches from the nerve supplying muscles acting on it. For example, uh, if you consider the uh, uh, knee joint, so the knee joint is supplied by the obturator nerve. So for that, the muscles are supplied by the obturator nerve. The muscles are supplied by the obturator nerve, which are also supplying the knee joint. So if if we find any difficulty or any problem in obturator nerve, so it it's going to hamper the function of obturator nerve. The muscles are supplying to the obturator nerve. Plus the knee joint. Am I clear to everyone? Yeah, yeah. The yeah, sorry. Now the the second cause of posterior hip pain is inflammation of bursa. So there are the uh, number of bursas around the hip joint. So posteriorly, we can see the iliosus bursa, ischial tuberosity bursa, and trochanteric bursitis. Now, but according to the research, uh, one researcher researcher has said there is no such terminology like bursitis and all. So they have just classified it as the greater trochanter pain syndrome. So Dr. Hassan has been taken this lecture about this. That was a great lecture. So you can uh, refer that lecture about the greater tuber greater tubercle pain syndrome. Dr. Hassan did this lecture like on, on GTPS. Uh, it's called Greater Trochanteric Pain Syndrome. It's available on YouTube if you guys want to watch it. So if your pain is going down the leg or it is uh, going down the knee from the back, so you can follow the dermatome. So for that, I have added this image. Brooming. Now we are going to see the papyriformis syndrome. As we know, uh, papyriformis is the major muscle which is acting while external rotator, the external rotation of the hip. So if you see the origin of the muscle, it will, this is the anterior part of your sacrum. So is it okay? So, if we see, this is the anterior part of your sacrum. So, it starts from second, third, and fourth digitation. And from the greater sciatic notch, it runs towards the middle head of the greater trochanter. So, see the origin of the uh, origin of the uh, pyriformis muscle. This is like this. This is a fan shaped kind of a structure, which is present around the sacrum, which is going to insert on the medial trochanter. The action of Pyriformis is when it when hip is extended, it acts as an external rotator, and when the hip is at 90 degree, it will act as the abductor. So, which will be uh, which we will uh, explain in pace test, which will be on the other next slide. I will explain what is the pace test, and the nerve supplied by S1 S2 is supplied is supplied to the uh, pyriformis muscle. Wait. If you see the images, Dhrumi can hear. Yeah. If you see the images, see uh, from where the muscles is coming and when where is the it's inserting. So while uh, considering the pyriformis muscle, uh, when you stretch the muscle or contact the muscle, you get the pain. So this is the important point. What kind of nerve supply it is? What nerve nerves are uh, around the pyriformis muscle? What is the blood supply to, to it is? So there is blood supply superior and inferior gluteal nerve and in pudendal nerve, it supplies uh, pudendal artery, it supplies to the piriformis muscle. Next. So we'll go a uh, little bit detail in about the piriformis syndrome. So a woman is the person 
who uh, speculated about the piriformis muscle with the sacroiliac joint osteoarthritis in 1928 so since 1928 there has been lot lot been uh, there has been lot of research has been done on the piriformis muscle and the piriformis syndrome was coined by the robinson in 1947 so uh, he has described a form of sciatica with the abnormalities in piriformis muscle so he has uh, introduced the piriformis and sciatica correlation as a piriformis syndrome in 1947 so if you see the piriformis syndrome was defined as a buttock pain or uh, or sciatica which is caused by the impingement of the uh, sciatic nerve so earlier it is to be diagnosed uh, diagnosed by the mri endoscopic visualization so we need to see the what are the symptoms we are getting after stretching and the contraction of the muscle so on the basis of that we are going to do the assessment of the piriformis muscle next so epidemiology of uh, piriformis uh, syndrome so globally there are 40 million cases are uh, has been found annually where out of that 6% are of uh, piriformis syndrome and average age group of uh, piriformis syndromes uh, which is found in the people are 38 years old where females are more uh, prone to piriformis syndrome uh, as compared to male the ratio is 6 is to 1 so more common in females than males now uh, one image is there in front of you of sciatic variation now we'll do a little bit of interaction so there are six images so uh, can you put the in chat box which of the images means which of the anatomical variations you are seeing that red part is piriformis that white white part are sciatic nerve so which image is going to give you the symptoms below below your knee like tingling tingling sensation burning sensation or down uh, down leg symptoms so will you please put put the number of images like a b c d e f in the uh, chat box which image is going to give the symptoms down leg to the first person this two four i mean you're kind of right so you you see those two i, I just want to clarify this you see the muscle and you see the nerve right yeah you have to tell us which patient presentation of its sciatic variation will have symptoms down the leg the answer is more than one okay the two branches you're seeing is common peroneal nerve and tibial nerve the top branch is common peroneal the lower branch is tibial we know that those are the two branches right so you have to tell us which will give you can I... The, the answer is just not one. You have multiple. You have to choose multiple options. So look at the e look at each picture, and then give us give us the right answer. So you said B C E. If you look at C, the nerve passes above and below. Are you guys getting the point? The red strip is piriformis muscle. The yellow is the nerve. All except six. I think you guys have to pay attention to this. I think we'll we'll do. One of you actually got it right. One of you got it right. Dr. Prashant, you can give the right answer. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for the answer, guys. Now the answer is B, D, and E. So why is the B, D, and E? If you see the first image A, the sciatic nerve is traveling from the lower border of the below the lower border of the piriformis so there will be no impingement happens at a uh, sciatic nerve so that has been ruled out second if you see the second image there where we we got the 30 13 percent of the patients in this case anatomical variation the muscles are traveling one branch is traveling from the middle of the muscle belly and uh, another branch is traveling from the uh, below the muscle so upper uh, the upper uh, nerve the upper branch is peroneal nerve where the lower branch is tibial nerve so there are the chances of impingement of the nerve where we can get the symptoms down the leg so b is the first answer now you can see now you will get the answer now you can see the c one muscle is coming from up one muscle is coming from down so there will be no impingement so c is not the answer now you can refer the d 
where the nerve is coming from the uh, middle of the belly without any bifurcation so there are there uh, if any contraction or stretching or any injury happen to the piriformis muscle so it will impede the sciatic nerve so they will also give the symptoms to down to the leg now if you see the e one is coming from the superior border of the piriformis and another is coming from the middle of the belly so you will also give us the symptoms where f where the muscle is coming from the superior border of the piriformis muscle yeah so now you can tell the answer so the answer is b d and e do you guys understand is so you seeing the red red strip that is your piriformis muscle the yellow is your nerve the bifurcation you see the top top branch is your Tib, uh, common peroneal the lower branch is your tibial so it doesn't if if common peroneal tibial or sciatic one of the branches or the whole nerve passes through the muscle you're going to have symptoms of numbness and tingling and that's why we don't when we see patients with piriformis hypertension or hypertonicity we don't have numbness and tingling in all all patients because because of this variation right there are six possible this is a uh that there's a question is this an evidence that if there is a there is nerve is beneath the piriformis that can it can it cannot give symptoms we can say but we cannot say with surety because nerve can get entrapped somewhere else right we know that nerve has a tendency to get entrapped multiple sites but yes in 87% of patients and this is a very very old research very established research if you look at any article recent article they do quote this research because this is a very established very highly cited article and we call it like beaten ensign classification okay it's it's good to know that perif sciatic nerve not always passes through piriformis okay okay thank you sir rumi <laughs> now uh, we are going to see the four chief clinical signs which has been selected after the systemic review they have been gone through the lot of researches and they have found that most of the researches have, uh, found out these four clinical signs in every case so you should remember the this four clinical signs which has been proven uh, proven by the research the first is the buttock pain which is aggravated on sitting the second is uh, external external tenderness near the greater sciatic nerve then the third is pain on any maneuver which which will increase the muscle tension and the uh, final one is limitation of straight leg raising which will vary according to the last images because if there is muscle uh, what what is the anatomical variation is there on the basis of that we are going to get the uh, get the assessment result on straight leg raising so uh, this is the one of the this is one has been done that. yeah one of the systemic review has been there so where 105 this has been done so out of that cases more than 50% cases has been found that uh, all these three th symptoms where it has been written in red so out of 105 research paper those over the cases of piriformis syndrome they got these three symptoms the symptoms were, the first symptoms were there the buttock pain the second symptoms was the radiation radiation symptoms and the third symptoms was the external tenderness so most of the piriformis cases found these three symptoms so it has been uh, proven by the research so now we are going to see the etiology of piriformis syndrome so what can cause the piriformis syndrome so if is there any kind of trauma happens uh, near your hip or buttock if you uh, instead of uh, instead of fall down anything which can cause uh, uh, injury to the sacroiliac uh, sacroiliac joint or injury to your piriformis muscle so it it can cause the piriformis syndrome second second is predisposing anatomical variant the image which we, which we have seen of the sciatic uh, sorry sciatic nerve and the piriformis now uh, uh, later on the my facial trigger points 
so uh, after the chronic pain uh, we have seen many cases uh, where piriformis syndrome is very chronic patient is telling you i i do have pain in my posterior buttocks since 20 years 10 years 20, uh, uh, many matlab uh, like uh, since long days so they they got uh, my facial trigger points in their gluteus maximus gluteus medius so there are chances of my facial trigger points has been uh, occurred at the muscles uh later on uh, hypertrophy and spasm of piriformis muscle because of injury or because of all the muscles uh, trigger points are just going to uh, over use the piriformis muscle so there there are the chances of spasm and hypertrophy of piriformis muscle can happen and the secondary to laminectomy as we have seen l3 nerve root nerve root is going to uh, it's going to supply to posterior hip so laminectomy happens in lumbar region it will also Uh, it can give you the piriformis symptom like of symptoms where uh, soft tissue involvement like abscesses hematoma myositis bursitis neoplasm uh, colorectal carcinoma cancer neuronema of sciatic nerve this is also uh, one of the type of cancer ap uh, sacroiliac sacroiliac lipoma so this can also give the pain uh, which can uh, referred as a piriformis syndrome later on intragluteal injections now many people are getting the injections of prp and uh, steroids so that could also give you the pain in piriformis where femoral nailing uh, in femoral nailing if any kind of surgery happen at femur joint so the, that could cause uh, gives the pain in piriformis where myositis also thickens of the piriformis muscle any bony things uh, are uh, happen after the fracture so uh, any calcific deposition formation end up give you the piriformis muscle syndrome and clipal uh, trinone uh, clipal trinone syndrome which is the genetic disorder where there is a derangement happens in ligaments and the muscles so what can happen the, and that happens in your lower limb so if there is a clipal trinone syndrome is there so uh, there is the chances of hypertrophy of the muscles happen and suppose this is happening in right leg so there will be the heaviness will be occurred and, and the patient can get the uh, pain in piriformis now uh, uh, we are going to see the differential diagnosis of piriformis syndrome so if you have the uh, pain in the piriformis so what could be the other uh, diagnosis chances are there so the first thing is dysfunction lesions and inflammation at sacroiliac joint so sacroiliac joint plays the important role as i have uh, i have already explained that if you have any uh, problems in sacroiliac joint it gives the neurophysiological inhibition at the gluteus medius muscle and it will uh, give you the tendinous sign so the uh, uh, biomechanics of sacroiliac joint is also important the second one is uh, pseudo aneurysm in the inferior gluteal artery following gynecological surgery if you see inferior gluteal artery is the blood supply of the piriformis muscle so if you find any kind of aneurysm so it will give you the pain so that could be the one of the reason for the uh, piriformis syndrome Uh, later on uh, thrombosis of the iliac vein the veins and arteries supplies uh, around the piriformis muscle if they got thrombus so they will also going to give you the pain in your piriformis later on painful vascular compression syndrome of sciatic nerve caused by the gluteal varicosity so again the blood supply where uh, the iliac vein and the arteries the arteries can get compressed so it will it can give the pain in the piriformis muscle so as we seen herniated intervertebral disc as the lumbar part the, the nerves as, as we see the hilton's law so the nerve supplied from the lumbar area and it is supplied to the posterior hip so th- this will give the referred pain to your uh, posterior hip post laminectomy happen in syndrome uh, post laminectomy syndrome coccidemia same uh, same again in uh, regarding the lumbar joint pseudo rally uh, pseudo radicular s1 syndrome uh, so anything uh, because the n- nerve supply of the jo- of piriformis muscle is s1 and s2 so if anything happens in s1 and s2 area this will uh, this will give you the piriformis uh, the piriformis muscle action uh, muscles involvement later on posterior facet syndrome which will happen at l4 l5 same the lumbar the uh, lumbar lumbar uh, plexus gives the supply to the our uh, posterior hip muscles later on unrecognized pelvic structure because of fracture the pain might be related to your piriformis muscle 
lumbar osteochondrosis where the uh, degeneration happens in the spinal canal the degeneration can be uh, at your uh, disc or uh, at uh, at the spinal uh, around the spinal canal which can also show you the symptoms as like a piriformis syndrome and the last one is undiagnosed renal stones many times patient shows the symptoms around your lower back or at the hip but uh, if you don't get better there are the chances of there would be the renal stones uh, in his kidney his or her kidney now uh, what test we can do for special test for uh, diagnosis of uh, piriformis syndrome but there is no such test as per, as proven this test is going to give us the exact clarity of uh, piriformis syndrome but there are the cluster kind of thing like fred lieber sign over test faber test somers test it will help us to diagnose so there is no gold standard test for piriformis syndrome it's a con confused diagnosis Yeah. So uh, these are the specific tests for piriformis syndrome. If you see the date of uh, published or date first described, so since 1934 till 2013, it has been shown many tests has been uh, selected for the piriformis syndrome. So as I have already mentioned, the PACE PACE test. So I will show you what is the PACE test. Dhrumi, can you show to the next slide? Yeah. So this is the PACE test. The patient is sitting at the uh, edge of the bed. Hip and knee is at at 90 degree angle. So we saw that uh, at 90 degree abduction of the hip joint is the function of piriformis. So what he is doing he is resisting the abduction movement at the hip joint. Suppose on the contraction or or any stretching, if he gets the pain. so we can uh, we can say there will be the piriformis muscle is in the picture next similar bug sign as uh, i have mentioned uh, uh, gluteus medius is the muscle the posterior part of gluteus medius muscle is uh, going to help to maintain our uh, both the hip joint at the same level or iliacus or asi csi at the same level but if you see if there if, if there any kind of sacral sacroiliac dysfunction so because of sacroiliac dysfunction there will be the neurophysiological inhibition happens at the gluteus medius muscle and because of that inhibition muscles are not working properly and uh, working properly and so the power goes down so because of that we can uh, we found the tendlenburg sign next So over stress. Uh, this is the modified over stress. So patient is in side lying position. So we are just externally rotating the hip. The physio is by the side of the uh, side of the patient, and we flex the knee to the 20 degree. And uh, after the external rotation and flexing the knee, we abduct and extend the hip, and the pal palpate iliac crest. And suddenly we uh, lowers the leg. If thighs drops to the 10 degree and below the horizontal. so there are the chances of we are uh, sacroiliac joint involvement is there or any hip pathology is there so for that for to rule out we do the mod uh, modified over stress next next is thomas test uh, this uh, this test all we know patient is lying down and patient is trying to uh, touch the knee to the chest and the hip and knee is in flexion position if patient uh, uh, the opposite hip gets uh, lift from the ground or from the bed so there are the chances of flexion contracture of or uh, swas syndrome so uh, swas major is involvement is there so you can uh, we can rule out the muscle by doing the thomas test the uh, patrick test which is also known as the faber test faber stands for flexion abduction and external rotation the patient is lying in supine position where we are doing the flexion and abduction at the hip joint so we are making the figure 4 uh, fig figure figure 4 position at the knee joint and we are going to stabilize the knee joint uh, opposite asi 
so after doing the figure 4 we just give the external rotation to the uh, external rotation to the hip joint if it found painful then it it gives the positive peptic test so it shows the, is there any involvement of si joint is there or not uh, we'll be sharing this presentation on youtube so you can very well relook at it most of our classes are Keep, keep going, Dr. Prashant. Yes, sir. Now, uh, refer them from the lumbar spine. As we have seen, uh, we get the most of the blood supply, sorry, nerve supply is getting from the L3 nerve root. So, if anything happens at the L3 nerve root, so we can get the referring pain at the posterior hip. Next. Now the major part is there, uh, SI joint dysfunction. As I have already mentioned, if is there any uh, pathology or any dysfunctions happen at a sacroiliac joint, it's going to hamper the uh, muscles around the hip joint. So uh, if you see the origin and insertion of the piriformis muscle, the SI starts from the uh, sacrum and it inserts on the uh, greater trochanter of the femur. So there could be chances of hypermobility, hypermobility, trauma, degeneration, inflammatory, infection, or any ligament or stress. So that uh, that could be, uh, that could give the pain to the, uh, uh, our uh, piriformis muscle. One uh, research has been done where ultrasonography, uh, so ultrasonography has been done on the posterior. Uh, in that study, if pain is there, major cause of the pain has been found out as a sacrotuberous ligament. So if we see, is there, if there is any dysfunction happens at SI joint, so there will be tension created at the sacrotuberous ligament. If we see what is the origin and insertion of the sacrotuberous ligament, it starts from here, it goes up like this. It starts from here, it goes up like this. So if any dysfunction happens, suppose the sacrum is going, anterior, posterior, up slip, down slip, anything happen. So there will be the uh, tension will be created at sacrotuberous ligament and it gives the pain to the patient. So it has been uh, proven in a research where the ultrasonographic study has been done. Okay. Another interesting point is that, I mean, when we talk about piriformis, I think Dr. Prashant mentioned that it's not just piriformis, it's inferior gemelli. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's also sacred tuberous ligament. It's also obturator internus. So you're just, I mean, we tend to be biased towards piriformis and calling it a piriformis syndrome, but sometimes there are other pain generators too. And especially when you're examining them, you need to look at other structures as well. Oh, yeah. Dr. Vishant, you can keep going. Yeah. So now pathology of the SI joint can be difficult to diagnose it. But uh, for, uh, for that, we need to do there are many pathologies like tumor, neurological examination has to be done or to rule out the, any pathologies, which includes radiographs, MRI scan, uh, fluoroscopic guided injection to the SI joint. And uh, the good manual therapist also can do the good assessment and can rule out the diseases uh, related to SI joints. Next. So uh, this is the image which gives the nerve supply related to anterior to the sacrum. So as we are talking about SI joint dysfunction, so these are the number of nerves which are present and on the anterior aspect of the sacrum. So if any dysfunction happens at the sacrum joint or in sacroiliac joint, so these muscle functions can get hampered. So we can see superior gluteal nerve, lumbosacral tongue, Common fibular nerve, inferior gluteal nerve, sciatic nerve, pelvic parasympathetic uh, sympathetic nerves, posterior femoral cutaneous nerves, perforating cutaneous nerves, pudendal nerves, hypogastric nerves, anocostigial nerves, flanking nerve, inferior hypogastric nerve, perforating cutaneous nerve. All these nerves are present on the anterior aspect of the uh, sacrum. So, is if is any kind of dysfunction happens, it can 
gives uh, it can interrupt the function of all the uh, muscles or all the soft tissues it is supplying to for example if you see the pudendal nerve if pudendal nerve is involved we get the bowel and bladder syndrome or we can get the pelvic sore uh, pelvic sore muscles symptoms so the muscle uh, which is supplied by one of these nerve can get the function of that muscles get hampered because of this uh, uh, sacroiliac dysfunction so the, the key thing guys piriformis is not exclusive to just buttock if you look at the, all the nerves i mean it's almost supplies everything down the leg right i mean if you look at the nerves i mean it supplies almost everything down the leg so when you're treating piriformis syndrome make sure you're keeping in mind that anything can get involved and as dr prashant mentioned pudendal nerve we see piriformis pain and we see pelvic floor inhibition or we see symptoms of incontinence symptoms of sexual dysfunction so make sure that you're looking at this it's a very interesting study thank you dr prashant thank you sir next now coexistence of piriformis syndrome with sa dysfunction so after uh, this, there is a correlation of piriformis syndrome and sa dysfunctions vice versa so this has been published by the yeoman in 1927 where he proved that there is a coincidence of sa disorder with the piriformis syndrome there is no systematic or randomized controlled trials are currently available to conclusively prove this association but if we see uh, the changes but while some case reports and with and some osteopathic expert opinion these are these people are emphasizing on this coincidence but still we have lack of clear evidence so further research has to be done for that next so after uh, all this uh, slide we are going to see a case study which i saw in my my clinic and i really want to share this experience so before doing the gym master class or gym co courses this patient has to be suppose this patient has to come to me i used to go for ultrasound or tens and all the traditional treatment so i'll read the case history first later on we'll discuss the assessment part later on we'll discuss the treatment part of this so the patient was 38 years old research scientist uh, in uh, pharmaceutical co cooperation so he has been uh, he had come with the pinpoint lumbar and uh, buttock pain so he had for that past two years and the uh, intensity of the pain has been increased since last two months when i uh, when i saw him i saw him one and a half years ago so previously uh, he consulted with orthopedician primary uh, care physician and um, uh, he did mri so where he found uh, he found that l4 and l5 discarnation so uh, since then he took the treatment uh, medication and all but he didn't get any kind of significant change in his symptoms so the uh, orthopedician sent him to the gastroenterologist because he was saying i get uh, some sometimes stomach upset and all so he went to the gastroenterologist so he did some ultrasonography ultrasound abdominal ultrasound sonography so he found that there is uh, no abnormality in that sonography so he gave him like multivitamin tablets like vitamin d3 and uh, some multivitamin tablets so later on uh, he he went to the uh, number of physiotherapists so before coming to me he had been to the eight physiotherapists so he has gone through the ultrasound tens massage and my my facial release matrix therapy also he has gone through and few exercises but uh, post that he found uh, better for for a while but all the symptoms came back again so after the treatment he used to feel better but next day he used to feel the pain again in his hip so there there hasn't been much improvement in the symptoms later on uh, we did the assessment next so we found uh, clinical findings are there uh, we found that uh, he has the right hip pain so flexion was 120 degree so extension was uh, near 20 degree which was uh, painful at the end of range of motion and external rotation were ex uh, uh, restricted and internal rotation was 30 degree so this was the range of motion and after mmt 
he found that right PGM posterior gluteus medius muscles power was three minus three on five, and external rotator strength was minus three on five. Sorry, three uh, three on five. Right uh, right hip external rotation strength was three on three plus on five, where right gluteus maximum was three plus on five, and supine to sit uh, test was short to long. I will explain later on what is supine to sit test. Uh, and on palpation, we have seen sacral base was deep, and inferior lateral angle was prominent, where sacro tuberous ligament was tender and painful on palpation, and he had closing dysfunction at L5 S1. On and he has restriction in extension, side bending, and rotation in his lumbar joint, where multiplex uh, activation was poor. So, sir, should I explain this? So, uh, point to sit and. Easy, yeah, yeah, yeah. Supine to sit is nothing but so. What you're trying to do is your, your patient is in supine lying, and you ask the you check the medial malleoli on either side and compare the leg length. So in this case, the leg was shorter on the right. When you ask the patient to come in long sitting, you check again, and the the affected side becomes longer. So we we conclude that the patient has a posteriorly rotated pelvis on the right side, on the affected side in this case. And then we did like we did like static palpation of sacral base, which was found to be deep. I mean, I think Dr. Uh, Dr. Prashant was talking about yeah. sacral tuberous yeah. ligament and ultrasound studies. He found sacral tuberous ligament to be tender to palpation. I think there are a lot of studies which talks about piriformis and sacral tuberous ligament, like ultrasound studies where they were testing for piriformis syndrome, but they found like, the tissues, tissue, tissue consistency of sacro tuberous ligament was affected. So with palpation, he found very similar findings, which research, I mean, I mean, research, you find the same thing. So, yeah. Now we'll discuss this case. Uh, next slide. So, uh, the diagnosis of this case was unilateral sector. So now we are going to see what is the unilateral sacral sector. If you see the images, while doing the flexion movement, the pelvis is going anteriorly, and while doing the extension movement, the pelvis is going posteriorly. So, uh, are you able to see this? So, consider this sacrum is as a the person in front of me is standing with sacrum. So, uh, this is the part of uh, sacrum, and this is the Ilium. So if we see, this is the sacral base and this is the infralateral angle of the sacrum bone. So which is the prominent part or which we can palpate. So if we see the last case where we saw that patient was having pain on the right side. So this is the right side, uh, right side uh, of the sacrum, this is the left side of the sacrum. The patient is facing me. So this is the posterior view of the sacrum. So where what found out the PSIS after finding out the PSIS, we uh, find out the sacral base. So this is the sacral base, and after the uh, find out the sacral base by making a triangle, we found out the inferolateral angle of the sacrum. So in this case, what happened on uh, palpation? This part was deep as compared to the left side. So this part was uh, deep and this part was, part was tender and painful on palpation. So uh, if you see the case, the right sacral base is deep in the clinical findings and the uh, right inter, uh, uh, inferior lateral angle is tender and painful. So suppose this is the ilium, this is the sacrum, this is sacroiliac joint. When sacrum is going into flexion, so this is the flexion, this is the extension. I am talking about the right side, just see on the right side. So this is the flexion, this is the extension, so this is the ilium. So if this part is going into flexion, right part is going into flexion, it's going anteriorly and deep, and this part is coming up and 
prominent where as compared to the sacrum the ilium is moving posteriorly so this is the ilium if it's going anteriorly relatively it's going posteriorly so the finding of that test was to point to see it the uh, when the patient uh, just a minute when uh, through me can you uh, open the clinical finding yeah so uh, can you see the talk a little bit about can you talk a little bit about closing dysfunction l5s1 yeah I mean, yeah yes yes so what is the closing yes closing dysfunction at l5s1 so if you uh, if you look at the movement uh, in uh, lumbar joint there is movement happens like flexion extension and side flexion so when we do the uh, when we do the flexion when we do the flexion at that time there is a opening of facets happen and then the anterior joint is moving on the post uh, inferior joint the anterior vertebra is moving on the uh, uh, inferior vertebra and while extension the flexion there so what happens in restriction closing dysfunction when we are doing the extension on l5 and s1 it is unable to close so patients are finding difficulty in closing means while suppose this is the l5 this is the s1 inferior facet this is the superior facet this is inferior facet so while doing the extension it should goes like down so it should get close but suppose it is unable to close patient found difficulty in all the restriction in all the movements so this is known as the closing dysfunction at s l5 s1 am i clear to everyone yeah you fine you fine you fine so basically what is happening is i mean l5 is not able to go we call it down and back not able to glide i'm just going to so if i have to just just one second guys i'll show this if this is l l4 l5 this is s1 when you do extension right ex extension right side bending and right rotation this should glide down like this and this motion is restricted the closing dysfunction is on only usually one side so it's right right l5 s1 okay and this is the secondary dysfunction to the primary primary dysfunction can you guys see see the video am i visible to you guys uh, okay let me actually uh, just one second guys Okay, so this is yes. this is L five. This is this is S one. When you extend, this goes down like this. This goes down like this, right? And when I extend, side bend, rotate. This should go like this, right? Okay, this should go like this. Whenever you have this closing dysfunction, this down and back motion with extension, right side bending, right rotation is missing. Okay. So this extension, side bending, right rotation is missing. And this is L5 is not smoothly gliding down on S1. Okay. And that is what is closing dysfunction is. Yeah. Okay? I hope it makes sense. Okay. Over to you, Dr. Prashant. I hope this answers yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. So just now uh, I have explained you the clinical findings when I said suppose this is the ilium, this is the sacroiliac joint. So right sacral base is this, and the inferior lateral angle is prominent. So this movement is happening on right side. This is the posterior right side. So relatively it is going posteriorly. The ilium is going posteriorly relatively to the sacral movement. So if you see the supine to sit is short to long. So the interpretation of short to long is posterior rotation. So how the posterior rotation happening? Sacrum base is going deep where an inferior, lateral angle, uh, inferior lateral angle is getting tender and relatively innominate going in posterior direction. So that is the interpretation of short to long. So this is known as the unilateral flexure. 
so if you see the symptoms of the in lateral flexion the patients might be having the back pain and buttock pain with or without radiation but um, most of the time patient says there is a pin point of pain in your uh, posterior rib so uh, earlier i used to see this kind of patient i used to give ultrasound only but he had been to the many physios before me so i did the uh, clinical findings or i did the assessment and i found that clinical findings later on i, I did the manual therapy mats and few exercise uh, prescription so he got better in two sessions only so where he did 3 to 4 months physiotherapy uh, earlier to me now he just do, uh, did to follow up and by doing the mat and manipulations we got him pain free so now we are going to focus on the, the next part would be the treatment part so what would be the treatment for this inverter section so treatment would be like uh, we'll do the lumbar pelvic stabilization the exercise is nice like bridges camps uh, clamps pretzels prone hip extension and slr we'll explain uh, in detail next now uh, we are going to see the treatment protocol uh, for the lateral sacral flexion uh, rumi can you go for the next slide so uh, we are going to see uh, manipulation techniques mat and exercises so uh, for uh, we have seen the symptoms were like or the clinical findings were posterior innominal rotation would be there and the sacrum is uh, one side of flexion is sacrum is in the flexion position so uh, to so we are we are going for first mat so the position of the patient is in prone line uh, when where is the leg is in the 15 degree abduction and it will be rotated and the physiotherapist physiotherapist would be the from the behind of the patient the uh, the uh, my right hand hypothenar would be on the eye of the patient and my left hand is just re re reinforcing the my right hand and my position is uh, like my both the elbow are straight but while inhalation i am just trying to give the force towards in anterior superior direction to the eye so i am trying to give the the these things i am trying to do the it has been done in this position so i am trying to do it. this is in posterior i am trying to do this by doing the mat by doing the muscle energy te- technique while inhaling the i am just going to apply the force and i am going to maintain that force while uh, exhalation also so i am doing the uh, mat for the lateral sacral flexion the dosage of the mat would be uh, 10 into 6 seconds with the medium intensity force so after doing the mat we can recheck the position and we can do the reassessment so are we doing on the are we going to, are we able to correct it or not or if we are not going to uh, correct it or if you are not finding the results we can repeat it three times so this is the mat techniques for the unilateral sacral flexion where legs in in uh, 15 degree abduction and internal rotation so i am just applying the force on the isla in antero superior direction next drumi can you play this video so this is the technique to gap posterior aspect of your si joint yeah it can that this technique can also be used for l5s1 so this is a great technique because it is gapping l5s1 which we know is sitting in closing dysfunction and and correcting posterior nominate dysfunction as well as unilateral sacral flexion so 1 and 3 so this is the manipulation technique for that the first was the mat technique now we are going to see the exercise prescription as we have seen the uh, external rotators were weak that was the 3 on 5 so this is for the 
external rotator uh, trending. The patient is in side lying, so the hip knee at 90 degree at the edge of the bed. Now patient is the the right leg is outside the bed, so patient will do the internal and external rotation at the hip. So this is the known as the pretzel exercise, which will help us to increase the strength of the external rotator of the hip. Next. So as we have seen, the multiplex activation was poor. For multiplex training, we are going for stagger stance weight shift. I'll show you how to do this. And the prone hip extension, the patient is lying in prone position. So that is the short arc hip extension, where we have uh, bend the knee at 90 degree. And we will do the uh, extension at the hip joint. I'll show you the stagger stance weight shift. So, I'm standing in lunge position, sorry, in stagger stance position, and my both the hands are just lateral to the transverse process of the lumbar spine on the multifeeder. I'm just shifting the weight on my right leg. My right leg is ahead and left is behind. I'm just shifting the weight on right leg and coming back to the normal position. So it will help me to activate my multifidus muscle. So we can do on left side also. So left side will be ahead. It will shift on left leg. We come back to the position. We shift on left leg. So you can feel the contraction at multiplex muscle if you do it practically. Next, Dhrumi. Next muscle is clamps, the progression. This uh, muscle is for the gluteus medius activation. Uh, we have seen the in assessment, in clinical presentation, where the gluteus medius was weak. So these are the progression. The right one, one has been written. That is the first, uh, the hip, hip and knee at, uh, in bending position. So we are just going to do the external rotation at the hip joint. That is the first uh, first step. We can progress it with the theraband. Later on, we can progress with the lifting uh, lifting of the leg. So that are the three progressions of the clamps has been there. So that will help us to increase the strength of the gluteus medius muscle. Next. So this is a monster walk exercise where So this is a little bit in squat position. So theraband is tied around your mid thigh in the just the side walking position. So it will help you. Basically, it's a we, it's a gluteus medius activation and functional yeah, position. Yeah. yeah. So extensor part of your hip, gluteus medius activation. next. So for the posterior hip chain. You can do the monster hip. walks without the band. The idea is we are trying to work on everything we found to be inhibited. We found the posterior gluteus media strength to be three on five or three plus on five. We found hip external rotators to be weak. We found gluteus maximus to be weak. We found multifidus to be not activating well. So we're just trying to, doc, uh, Dr. Prashant is just showing us various exercise ideas to work on the things which he found to be weak. And that's what we do, right? If you find something weak, we want to train them after we fix the positional faults. Okay. And hopefully that piriformis will just calm down. Yeah. 
next exercise was bridging and its progression for posterior hip chain so we found that gluteus was weak and hamstring so we were focusing on hamstring plus gluteus so this uh, the number one that is the basic gluteus uh, bridging we did that would be the progression with the gluteus medius activation when we tie the thera band uh, next slide that would be the <clears throat> that would be third progression we are keeping uh, both the heel on the stool or we can put on the step and we do the bridging with both the leg and after that if you want to progress it we can uh, do the uh, slr on one side and other side will be on the stool or step we can do the bridging so these are the four progressions of uh, bridging exercises next yeah these are the references from where we took the slides and all the information thank you guys for be patient and thank uh, you tj sir and steve sir for this opportunity uh, uh thank and, you thank you dr prashant i mean i think we're going to stick around thank for... you thank you yes yes if you have any doubts you can ask in chat box yes do you mind going back to the previous slide uh, or to the bridging i think there are various forms of bridging exercises you can do you can do it with the without band you can do it on the chair you can do it with the single leg you can do it with the slr you can do like a wide variety this lecture will be available on youtube so that you can go back and relook at the slides i think the idea is that all of us can treat better than we we treat i mean and you can follow us on various social media channels or social media platforms rather Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Prashant, for the great lecture. Thank, thank you, sir, for this opportunity. Thank you, Dhrumi, for coordinating. You can you guys can follow us on Instagram or and Facebook and YouTube. This lecture will be there on YouTube. Uh, please tell me the difference between anterior pelvic. Can you go back to anterior and posterior pelvic till slide one more time? Yeah. So if you look at this, anterior pelvic tilt includes where ASIS is going down. I think Dr. Prashant was talking about two horizontal lines and you can see that it, it, and ASIS is going down, causing close kinematic chain flexion. Exactly opposite is happening in posterior pelvic tilt. You're getting that kind of relative hip extension with posterior pelvic tilt. So this is an interesting thing. So if you're trying to differentiate between obturator internus and gemelli from piriformis, with physical exam, it's almost impossible. And that's why, because piriforming, piriformis being the biggest muscle, we tend to say it's a piriformis syndrome. But a lot of people who do ultrasound guided dry needling or ultrasound ultrasonic studies, they can find the differenti differentiation between Piriformis and obturator internus. I think there are people in the US who teach courses where they teach dry needling, ultrasound guided dry needling, and they can different really differentiate between obturator internus, inferior gemelli, and piriformis. Physical examination, I think, is not enough. Yeah. But the point is that the point we were trying to make is just not the one muscle. If it was just one muscle, I know that's a muscle we've studied a lot research wise but it's just not the not one muscle it's just three external rotators trying to be become hypertonic and you have to find why they are hypertonic i think dr prashant discussed that in greater detail yeah yeah 
Any more questions, guys? Okay, that's, that's a good question. I mean, yes, I mean, ideally both should be positive. If you contract, it should be positive. And if you look at the tests, I think, uh, Doc, uh, Grumi, can you share that slide where we were talking about all the special tests? So either you can contract the muscle or you can stretch it. You can do Superman's exercise if you're finding glute max weakness, yes. And Superman's also target the multifidus. You can definitely, with specific, this specific patient, yes, you can do a Superman's exercise. So I think go to the next slide, uh, next slide, slide after this. Yes. So if you look at this, I mean, uh, no, previous slide, sorry, previous slide. Yeah. If you look at this slide, I mean, you can see that some of these, the, some of these movements are nothing, but you're just trying to stretch the muscle. Fair, fair test. Maintaining the hip in flexion, abduction, and internal rotation. This is a stretch, piriformis stretch technically. And then you see this, Active piriformis, this is a resisted test. Resisted piriformis. So either you can activate the muscle or stretch the muscle, but that's not the point. The point is why, which I think Dr. Prashant explained it, why the piriformis is becoming angry. Other, other, other sacral dysfunctions can cause piriformis syndrome or can be related to piriformis syndrome, but Unilateral sacral, if you look at the osteopathic literature or, liter or some of the case studies, unilateral sacral flexion has more propensity towards getting this kind of kind of syndrome. But other, other sacral dysfunctions can sometimes give you piriformis syndrome. Yeah. And I think enough literature out there starting from human to like recent research, piriformis syndrome and SI dysfunctions go hand in hand. So the idea is not to treat piriformis syndrome and understand the anatomical variations of sciatic nerve has a strong association with it, yeah? I mean, I think it's sometimes very good to look at the literature because it opens your eyes towards other things, yeah? You can pick up any, any, any osteopathic book. Uh, can you explain your question? J-stroke by IASTM. I'm not a fan of IESTM. Research on IESTM is very limited, if that's what you're asking. I mean, any more questions, guys? Release the PSIS. Yeah, you can try to by ASTM. Yes, you can, but you have to fix the underlying cause. Yes, you can do all the soft tissue work, uh, all the massage. If you look at the case study Dr. Prashant presented, he was talking that the patient had ma massage done, all the passive modalities done. ISTM is nothing but massage by a by an instrument, right? Yeah, uh, and the evidence on ISTM is so poor. I know Sherman mentions that even long can give you symptoms. What are your views on it? Yes, weak hip external rotators can give you symptoms. Long means weak, right? So weak hip external rotation can give you weak. Can you can give you symptoms? Sometimes it actually depends on the depends on the Craig's angle. We always talk about how Craig's angle make a determination the strength strength in your hip internal external rotators. So I would I would also look at also look at strength in the hip external rotators. So when you talk about long long piriformis, we talk about hip external rotation strength being less. Yeah, which I think Dr. Prashant spoke about. His patient had only three plus, three on five, right? Definitely. Sometime targeting the piriformis also. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. You're changing the, if you're targeting piriformis, you're definitely affecting sacral mechanics, right? Yeah, so it can affect, I mean, 
affect, affect can sometimes improve the activation in gluteus medius. And if you improve activation in gluteus medius, it will affect, it will change the change the loading pattern and it will can improve medial knee pain for sure. Right? If you've attended our courses first, you know what I'm talking about. I think next weekend we're going to be doing another free lecture. We're going to be talking about complex regional pain syndrome. Okay, we're going to talk about complex regional pain syndrome. We're going to talk about role of manual therapy. Some latest systemic reviews have been published on it. Uh, General of Orthopedic or JOSPD, General of Orthopedic Sports and Manual Therapy has published published some very recent research on it. So 